element. It's been a while since I've said that. I've been gone for a long time. I'm really glad to be back here. And I'm glad to see all your faces. Will you guys stand with us? We're going to sing a song. have a seat for a few announcements. Good morning, Element. Good morning. My name is Clarence Harlow. If you've been around Element for any length of time, you've probably seen me volunteering in various capacities as a greeter on the prayer team or today on praise and worship. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we're so grateful you are here, especially if you are new. If you are joining us in person this morning for the first time, we would, you will find two cards behind the seats in front of you. One is for you to keep and tell us, uh, tells you a little bit about ourselves, and the other is for you to, uh, so we can know you a little bit more. 
and know that you were here today. Please place the one you fill out in the offering boxes located near the exit doors, or we would love for you to bring it back to the Welcome Center after service and say hello to us where we would be happy to answer any questions you might have. If you're joining us on uh, virtually today, welcome. We may, you may see the digital connect card linked to this video or simply say hello in the chat area. The biggest thing you need to know about us here at Element is that we love Jesus. Jesus! Our hope is that when you think about Element, you think of people who love Jesus and strive to connect more people to him. We are a gospel-centered community who finds our identity in Jesus. I only have two announcements for you this morning. The first is one, the first is one that I am particularly excited about. It has been a few years since Element has been able to offer the Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University course, or FPU as it is sometimes called, and we are so happy to, to be able to bring this back. I personally am looking forward to facilitating this class as I have gained so much from following Dave Ramsey's principles for financial freedom. If you are unfamiliar with FPU, it is a nine-week course that helps you teach that helps you teach you the biblical principles of money management. Whether you tried to get out of debt or trying to figure out how to save more money for your children's re education or retirement, etc., the lessons learned throughout this course will provide you with tools to reach these goals faster and in a way that honors God. I don't know about you, but I have not always been as financially well off as I am today. I, I don't say this to boast, or, but rather to give you a hope and to encourage you to trust in Jesus. Prior to taking FPU course, I was heavily in debt and, even, and not even living paycheck to paycheck. In fact, there was a season when my family and I were on welfare and had to get food from the food bank. I struggled with those scriptures found in Isaiah, Matthew, and Luke, which tells you to follow, to, um, tells God's family, excuse me, to trust in God for my needs and to be a generous giver as well. You know, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, give to the poor. I wanted to be a generous giver. I wanted to tithe, but how could I give to others when I was barely scraping by myself? Well, Dave Ramsey, through his Financial Peace University course, using biblical principles, taught me, and will teach you as well, how to live debt-free and how to be a generous people that God has called us to be. I wish I knew all these principles back when I was in my 20s or 30s, as I am positive I would have been able to retire much earlier than I am now. I thank God that my children are now using these principles themselves earlier than I did. There is a cost associated with this course, which will include your digital workbook, access to different tools uh, on the FPU website, and more for $79.99. There is also an option to pay an extra $20 to get a physical workbook. If these amounts seem impossible for you at this time, please know Element believes in this course and wants to be able to support anyone interested in taking it. So if finances are an issue, please don't let, don't let this stop you from taking this course. Come and talk to us about a possible scholarship. The FPU class begins Thursday, August 3rd at 6 p.m. Child care will be available, but you will need to sign up ahead of time so we can make sure that, you have an, that we have enough volunteers. More details as well as a registration link and child care sign up may be found in today's sermon notes in the Bible app as well as in the Church Center app. The second announcement I have for you today is about the E-Family Summer Splash Sunday, which is happening today immediately after each service. If you've been here the past few months, you know that Element has been trying to encourage others, <clears throat> excuse me, encourage more involvement between younger generations at Element and those in this room. Once a month, we have been doing various activities in the courtyard, after each service that is designed for all to participate in, young or old, with kids or without, today is a day to come to play, come play with the kids or just to root them on. There is going to be a, a balloon toss as well as other water-based activities, so please hang out after the service and try to connect with someone you don't normally talk to on Sunday mornings. That is all the announcements I have for today. As always, you may find more details and all of today's announcements in the Church Center app or 
in today's sermon notes in the Bible app. Now, I invite you to take a few moments to say hello to the people around you. All right, all right, all right. I, I don't know what happens during the summer at Element. But the last two weeks, the room has been like pretty full. And then today we start and it's freezing outside. It was like, I'm not going. I mean, first time it's got really nice last week. Y'all come in your shorts. It's like great. And now it's like, you know I mean, it's summer. I'm not going to wear shorts. Anybody ever been to the courthouse when you got your jury duty summons? Yeah, do you? So do you recognize Clarence and the voice and, and the narration? Uh, I, I told Clarence this because someone texted me this and said, man, Clarence sounds like the narration on an Instagram video. <laughs> and I told him that because he does. He's like very precise. Here's the words. Dun, dun, dun. I'm like, wow, they're not going to know what to do with me. I mumble, I talk too fast. Just give Clarence everything here. All right, so way to go, Clarence. Good job. I like your tennis shoes, too. They're like really bright. Everyone's like, what? Yeah, he'll be up here later. You'll see it again. Uh, I do have also have one announcement, and that is we are doing our next round of what we call uh, Quick Connect Groups. Uh, our next series is going to be starting next week. And with the starting of that series, if you're not in the gospel community, you don't know what that is, uh, talk to Sarah at the Welcome Center. She'll let you know all about that. But we're also doing... Uh, different ways to connect. That's why we do these QCGs, these quick connect groups. They're, they're about, this one's I think going to be about eight weeks long and you can sign up. There's a beginning date. There's an end date. So if you're like, I don't like this, you can be like, okay, you can go find another one. It's okay. Uh, so we have, they're going to meet uh, throughout the week at particular times. And if you're like, but I can't this week, I, it's, I'm not going to be back for another couple weeks. We, one is actually starting at the beginning of August as well. So if you're interested in a QCG, uh, talk to Sarah at the Welcome Center. She'll explain what that looks like to you and we can get you more information. I think that's really all I got out of the making fun of Clarence. So, uh, Hey, if you are new to Element, welcome. There are Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't own one, you can have one. If you forgot one, you can use one. There are sermon notes on the communion tables around the room. They look like this. And on the inside, you're going to get a recap of what we talk about today, some questions to talk to one another about that reflects on what we talk about today. On the back, you'll get the verses we are going to hit. Underneath that, you get a place to write down some notes. If you have a smart device, you can download an app. It is called Uversion. Once you download it, it just says Bible. You click on more and then events in version. We will come up by GPS in your smart device. You will get sermon notes, verses, questions, announcements, all that goes with today's message. 
Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? And this is Galatians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. And it says this, But far be it for me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Let's pray. Father, this morning we ask that you would teach us what it means to be a people who center our lives around the good news of what you did to rescue us at the cross. That we would understand the cross and resurrection and that our lives would, when we boast, we would boast in that, what you have done, not in ourselves. And that you would gain great glory by how we begin to live out all the things that we've learned throughout the book of Galatians. Amen. Have a seat. So this is Galatians week 26. Today we'll finish the book. I will pause for applause. For you, not for me, okay? Because I could have made the book longer, but you made it half a year, the book of Galatians. Today, Paul is going to sum up the entire letter of why it was written in the first place. But where I want to start is that there is this moral philosopher, his name is uh, Alessandro McIntyre, and he says that if you want to judge whether something is good or bad, you have to do it through its purpose. And he gives the illustration of a watch. And he says, if you're trying to figure out if a watch is good or bad, you have to say, well, what's it good or bad for? If you use a watch to tell time, then it's good. If you use a watch to pound in a nail as a hammer, then it's bad. And so you have to ask, is something good or bad, good or bad for what? And so he talks about humanity. And he says, if humanity is an accident, that at the end of billions of years, the sun burns out and everything we've ever done is just gone and a waste and there's nothing, there's no point to anything we have ever done, then that's bad. If there's no God, everything's meaningless. But if there is a God, and in Jesus we see the purpose we were created for, we begin to step into what life calls us to, what He calls us to, then that's good. Now, the same thing can be said for the book of Galatians. What is its purpose? Galatians is a terrible TV or movie manuscript. It just would be. But it's an amazing recitation of grace and how we're supposed to live. And if we look at Galatians and we use it for its intended purpose, we gain knowledge, we gain understanding, we get a deeper understanding of grace, and that is good. So Paul, at the end of the book of Galatians, is going to tie all of this together, but it's more than a wrap-up. This is what the entire letter's aim has been. And I can make jokes about preachers who have a tendency to say, oh, this is the best verse in the entire Bible. This is the best verse in the book of Galatians. But I got to say, Galatians 6.14 is really one of the best verses in Galatians, and really, I would even say the entire Bible. So don't judge me when I say how great I think it is, because it talks about the power of the cross. It explains the meaning of it. Galatians 6 14, the NIV says it like this, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And it really seems this is the point of the whole letter, the whole last 26 weeks. We could have just started here and ended here. And you've been like, oh, hey, that's great. It's the cross of Christ alone. But we can only boast in it if we understand what it is. So if you've never heard about the cross, today's going to be a, a great thing. If you've known about the cross your entire life, today's also going to be a great thing. We're going to talk about it. So buckle up. All right. So the first thing is this. What is the cross. Well, it's not just a pretty piece of jewelry that singers or rappers wear around their neck as they talk about decadence. It's not a magic weapon to burn a vampire's face off. The cross is a very real device used in the ancient world to kill people brutally in a way that brought degradation and shame. If you strip away all the sentimentality that we have around the cross today, you're confronted with the fact that it is a weapon of torture and intimidation. People today will be executed by lethal injection, electric chairs. Uh, when I was putting this message together, one guy was trying to get a case to go to the Supreme Court to die by firing squad. I didn't follow it. I don't know how it turned out, so don't ask me. I'm just saying I saw it. It was really weird. But the cross is far worse, far less humane, far more gruesome, an altogether hideous way to die. 
I don't know if you know this, but the early church, they never wore crosses around their neck. They never put them in their buildings because it was too grisly a reminder, too humiliating a reminder for the Lord of glory, for Jesus. There were many people who refused to even believe that Jesus was the Messiah because God would not, God would not allow his Messiah to come and die in such a demeaning way. Therefore, Jesus could not be the Savior. Crucifixion was always reserved for the worst punishment, and it was so horrendous, we made a new word that came from it called excruciating, which means from the cross. The Persians invented it. The Romans perfected it. And crucifixion was done publicly. It was done like down at the Crossroads Center at the Walmart, Santa Barbara Bowl, a slow farmer's market where everybody could come by and look and you'd see the spectacle and throw rocks and spit on these people who were dying in front of you. Death from crucifixion could take days. And people from all over the earth feared what crucifixion was. As time went on, the Romans learned how to prolong crucifixion, how to make it last longer because they wanted more humiliation, more pain. Because when you died from crucifixion, you would have to pull yourself up to breathe. You're like, <gasps> and that's how you would die. You wouldn't die from blood loss. And so what the Romans did is they put a little seat under the buttocks of people so it would take them longer to die. Now, some people, some men wanted to die quicker, so they'd slide off of that. And I don't, I don't mean to be, if you have kids, plug their ears real quick, but I don't mean to sound gruesome in this. But what Romans in some cases did is they would nail a man's genitalia to the cross so they couldn't slide off that seat. So it would take longer to die. It was gruesome. It was ugly. Now, I don't think that happened to Jesus because after Jesus was beaten, he died very, very quickly. Crucifixion is also done at eye level. You see the pictures, right? They're, always, they're up on a hill with the sun behind them. Oh, it's so beautiful. It was not beautiful. It's done at eye level so you could watch a person die. And yet, and yet, Christians, including me, we call this good news. How is this good news? You know, what could it possibly mean to boast in the cross of Christ? Because you do not typically tell people to boast. And if you do, it's not in torture devices. It's not, hey, I'm thrilled about the electric chair. Oh, Element's got a new motto. It's called uh, guillotines are great. We're going to put that on all of our t-shirts. It's going to be wonderful. No. Okay. So when Paul talks about boasting, it means how we verbalize our confidence in something, how we make our hope audible. So when Paul says boasting, this is not a self-centered, prideful type of thing. Boasting is, as one writer says, hope that you can hear. No one's going to ever be able to look into your heart or your life and see where your confidence lies unless they hear you begin to talk about it. What you get you excited? What makes you celebrate in your life? And if we are honest, we all boast. We're always expressing our confidence in something or another. We can't help it. We are hardwired to do it. If you have a Bible, open to 1 Corinthians 15. It's on page 624 if you're going to use one of the Bibles at Element. Now, I know you're thinking, 1 Corinthians, we're going to finish Galatians today. Yes, I promise we'll get there, okay? Often we boast in objects that we think will provide us a happy tomorrow. Uh, I boast in a relationship, a, a job, a house I bought, a car, shoes, phones, computers, bands, sports teams. Sometimes we boast in ourselves something that we think we are so great about. We boast in some quality we possess. Could be real, could be imagined, but we boast in that. But what does Paul, and by extension, those of us who believe in Jesus boast in? May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This means we look towards the cross as the center of our life and our redemption and our grace that we have from God himself. Every good in our lives and ultimately in the world will come from this event of the cross. It means we put zero confidence in anything else. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4 says this, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died. And if you stop right there, it's like, well, that's not good news that Jesus died. But there's a theological understanding of that event. That Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that's why it's good news. Because this is the only hope we have ever had of a restored relationship with God. When I say the word the cross, I don't mean a piece of wood. What I mean is what Jesus did on that cross for us. 
Now, there's two big words I'm going to give you. If you go to our gospel class or our weekender, I will explain this more in detail. But these two big words are called propitiation and expiation. Don't glaze over. Okay, listen to the explanation of this. Propitiation simply means to make favorable. It has the idea that uh, dealing with God's wrath against sin because, and so we sin, so God adds wrath against our sin, so it deals with that and it can make us favorable to God. Expiation has the idea of the removal or the cleansing of sin, and it means to make pious. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says, He, that's Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Expiation comes in, removes our sin. Propitiation then makes us favorable because Christ's righteousness is laid upon us. So propitiation includes expiation. And these things go together. You propitiate a person. You expiate a problem. And so we are made favorable with God himself. This is why we call the cross, here's another big word, substitutionary. Substitutionary because Jesus substitutes himself in our place for our sins. Paul's words about boasting in the cross are important because there's a lot of cool, hip, trendy pastors, preachers today who are bringing this doctrine under attack. People want to shy away from it because the doctrine of what the cross really teaches is offensive. And guess what? It is. It is. It's, it's very offensive. People trip over it because we think we are good enough on our own, that we don't need what God does for us. I'll clean myself up. I'll go to church. God will see how good I am, and then I'll have it all together. No, we need to grasp the severity of the doctrine of the cross and what it means for God to come into our lives and declare us clean. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so what Jesus does is he comes and he dies in our place as our sacrifice. Now, if you have a Bible, open to Galatians chapter 6. Now, this is on page 633 if you're using one of the Bibles at Element. The cross, the gospel, this is the language of God's love of God's restoration, of God's reconciliation. So why would God do this? I love how John Calvin said it, uh, my paraphrase. He says, because the Father wanted his kids back. That's the reason for the cross. So Jesus dies to defeat our enemies of Satan, sin, and death. Not God's and nothing can stand against God. These are our enemies. So Jesus comes in the flesh to save us, redeem us, and bring us to himself. And when it says flesh, that means real flesh and blood. And all sin at one moment is laid upon Jesus. He bears the brunt of it all. Not just other people's sins, but your sins and my sins. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 11. Paul says this, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. He's saying they want you to do these things so that you can be saved on your own by following the law, but that doesn't work. Verse 13, For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may both Boast in your flesh, but far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God, which is what we get adopted into, that family. So Paul gets to the end of the book, and he starts like this. See with what large letters I am writing to you. Now, there's a lot of speculation on this. It could be one that Paul has been dictating through his secretary to this point, and now he's writing in his own hand. Secondly, it could be, as we've talked about before, that Paul has these eye issues. A lot of historians believe that he had something wrong with his eyes, so when he writes, it has to be really big in order to see it. You know, maybe that's like, you know, John Hancock in the Declaration of Independence. John Hancock. Paul starts writing like that. Or three, Paul writes with big, bold letters because this is the main thing. The cross, that's what's important. I want you to see this. And it could be any combination of those three things. But secondly, the central importance of the cross. 
Verse 14 again, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that little line there, far be it from me, most commentators will tell you it's almost untranslatable. We don't know what to do with it. The King James will use the word God forbid, even though God's not in the text. Almost anything you say about this is too weak. The Greek construction is like, may it never be. But it's what's called a strong negative. And he says, under no circumstances may I ever, ever, never may I ever, right, do anything but this. Going back to the whole point of the Galatians and the gospel, there is only one thing that is necessary. Nothing else comes close, and that is the cross, what Jesus did to rescue and save us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, And when I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That doesn't mean that Paul doesn't know all the things Jesus said or did. He doesn't mean that everything Jesus did doesn't matter. He's saying there's nothing remotely close to the cross. That brings us to the good news of the gospel. So let me see if I can get some hot water here, um, I, which is very easy for me a lot of times. Um, I would say the average Christian today has a personal theology that says what really matters spiritually is not what you believe, but how you live. Like our beliefs don't really matter about God, Jesus, redemption, justification, incarnation, resurrection, ascension. The important thing is whether we live like Jesus and love our neighbors as ourselves. And you know what that is? That's works. And this is what Paul has been arguing against the entire book. You are not saved by your works. You are saved by the work of Christ. Where? On the cross. That's what he's saying. Do we follow his teaching and turn the other cheek as peacemakers? Oh, that's the important thing. Not what you believe, but how you live. Okay, what does Paul say? He does not say, far be it for me that I should boast except through the Sermon on the Mount. Far be it for me that I should boast except in the Ten Commandments. Far be it that I should boast except in turn the other cheek. No, he says the exact opposite. Far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul essentially says what really matters is not that teaching of Jesus, but what Jesus came to do. Now, before you crucify me, all right, I am not saying it doesn't matter what Jesus said we should be doing, because we just spent the last three weeks talking about that. I am not saying it doesn't matter what Jesus taught. It is extremely important. But 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. What is first importance? That is. Christ died. First importance, right? For our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, does Jesus' own teaching show this? Of course it does. Of course it does, right? You go to Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. Jesus says to Peter, who do you say that I am? Right? And Peter says, oh, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, my father revealed this to you. This is correct. Then Matthew 16, verse 21 says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter tries to stop Jesus. He's okay with Peter. As long as Peter's, as long as Jesus is a good teacher, you know, tells us how to live and pray and love others, approach God. Oh, that's great. But as soon as Jesus says, you want to know what I'm really about? I have to come to die because you cannot save yourself. This sacrificial system that's been going on for a thousand years is only pointing towards me. I will be the final sacrifice. I will be your savior. Peter can't handle that. Peter flips out. I don't believe it. And it's not like Jesus goes, oh, well, you have your belief and I have mine. That's not what he says. Matthew 16, 23, what Jesus says is, get behind me, Satan. Yow! I mean, that is, that is like fighting words right there. Jesus says, Peter, you are in the grips of Satan if you refuse to see the main thing that I am coming to do. I'm coming to die and everything else is superfluous. Not that it's meaningless, but the cross is what eternity revolves around. One writer says it like this, God forbid that anything else would have the centrality in your head and your mind and your heart, but the cross. The apostles, they, they finally got this. How do you know? You look at the gospel accounts, right? The gospel accounts are terrible biographies about Jesus' life, right? You get so little of what he did, but you get lots about the cross. John will spend 12 chapters 
in his book just flying through Jesus' life. And then he totally slows down. That like the second half of the book of John is all about the last week of Jesus' life because it's pointing to the cross. This is why Paul says, Galatians 6, 12, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. It's about your works. That's what they're trying to tell you. And only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. What he's saying is they don't get it. They're like Peter used to be. Verse 15 of Galatians 6, he says, For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. How does that new creation come about? The cross! <laughs> Boom, right? The gospel, the good news of what he came to do. I was reading this thing from Tim Keller, and I thought it was really funny because he talks about how he gets so angry at the Apostle John at times, right? Because he says, I got so many questions and moral dilemmas, and he runs across at the very end of the gospel of John. John 21, 25, he says, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And he says, here's a guy who has the audacity to come and say, I could have given you thousands of pages on what Jesus taught and what he did, but I want to give you what equates to about 25. And Keller's like, I needed those pages, you idiot. <laughs> I needed those things. You spend three years with Jesus, then he dies and resurrects, and you spend 40 days with him after the resurrection, before the ascension, intense uh, teaching from Jesus, and all I get is what equates to 25 pages? He says, when he calms down, he realizes that what John is telling us is we don't need more than he gave us because what we need is the cross. And that's what he points to. What John, Paul, all the apostles are saying is if you have the cross, if you understand the cross, you don't need one more verse than you have. We boast in the cross. It's our confidence. So third thing, three-point sermon. Wow, it's like a thing. Third thing is this. How do you know you understand the cross? How do you know? And this is where we're going to get a little offensive, maybe. It, the question is this. Have you been offended by it? Have you ever been offended by it? Because that's almost the test. Because the cross, by nature, is offensive to a sinful people who don't want to own up to what it means. See, the only way to understand the cross is to understand what we have actually been saved from. The cross was so offensive that these false teachers did not want to deal with the ramifications of what it meant. And a lot of teachers today are repulsed by the cross, this whole idea of substitutionary atonement, where they downplay it all together. When people hear about the cross and our sin, our acceptance in Christ, almost no one says when you really understand it, oh, that's wonderful. When you really understand it, you're like, oh my goodness. What have I done in my life? Most people, when they understand the cross, are first offended by it because it exposes who we are. And we have to come to grips with who we are and then how good God is. So let me say something else controversial. If you've never been offended by it, you may not have understood it completely. And if maybe it's never made a difference or a change in your life, well, maybe that's because you haven't been really offended by it. Because Peter was offended and Paul was offended before trusting Jesus. John the baptizer, John the baptizer's disciples were all offended by it. They even went to Jesus and said, hey, is there someone else that we should be looking for? And in Matthew eleven six, 6, Jesus will say this, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now, that cannot mean that everybody in the world who has never been offended by Jesus, you know, is, is blessed. It means anyone who has come to grips with what he did is going to feel the offense, but the blessed is the one who has dealt with it and walked through it with him. One writer says, blessed is the one who has felt the offense of the cross, but hasn't taken offense at the cross. Now, I am not saying that if you haven't been in despair over the offense of the cross, you can't be saved. But it is really important to understand how offensive the cross is. Philosopher Alfred Jules Ayers says the Christian doctrine of atonement on the cross is intellectually contemptible and morally outrageous. Bertrand Russell said no one who is profoundly human can believe God would punish sin like that. And he calls the cross, his words, the doctrine of cruelty. R.C. Sproul was preaching one time about the doctrine of the cross. And this guy gets up in the middle of his sermon and he yells out, that's primitive and obscene. And he walks out. That's the offense of the cross. Why? Because the cross is the greatest monument to our impotence and wickedness. Dr. Roger Nicole says it's like this. He goes, 
Imagine your house is burning down. You get all of your kids and everything outside and your house is burning down. Your neighbor comes running up and your neighbor says, let me show you how much I love you. And he goes running into your house and throws himself on the fire and flames and he dies screaming. He goes, you don't go, oh yeah, look how much he loved us. You say, what an idiot. Why, why would you go and do that? He goes, but if you're outside and maybe one of your kids is still in the house. And the firemen are like, it's too hot. We can't go inside. We can't save your child. And your neighbor says, let me show you how much I love you. And they run in your house and they save your kid at the cost of their own life. Then you would say, oh yeah, look how much they loved you. Now, Dr. Nicole's making this point. He says, do you believe all good people everywhere can find God if they just seek him and pray? Like the cross doesn't matter if you're sincere. It sounds so open-minded, but the truth is you're either hopelessly lost and Christ's death on the cross shows there is no other way for any to be, anybody to be saved, or it doesn't. It's one or the other. Not trying to seek God, not trying to be good, this is the only way. Because for Jesus to die voluntarily, if there is any other way to save us, would make him an idiot. It would make him insane. And if you say, Jesus died on the cross, and that's wonderful, but I think all good people anywhere can find God, that's impossible, and you're wrong. You start to feel the offense of the cross? Like, oh my goodness, what is that? I'm wrong, I can't be wrong. That's the offense. Many more liberal theologians today get upset because it sounds intolerant, it sounds so exclusive. Exactly, this is why we're saved by grace. Saying all good, wise people anywhere can come to God sounds open, but it's not. It is so exclusive because what happens to the people who are moral failures? What happens to the people who aren't wise? What if you're not wise and not moral like me? How in the world am I ever going to make it in? See, the cross is exclusive, but it's inclusive in that everybody is welcomed in. How offensive is it to realize that we are all the same without Jesus? If you really think about that, the faithful spouse and the adulterer, both. The pro-life advocate and the abortion doctor. Uh, Joe Biden. Hunter Biden, Donald Trump, all the same. The great parents and the parents who left their kids in the car with the windows up and their child died. Do you see the offense? You are not better. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 25. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, there's our word, by His blood to be received by faith. What does the cross mean? The cross means there is no difference. There is no difference. Many conservatives will look at the cross and say, oh, grace, I don't like that grace. That's, that's too easy. You've got to be more moral. And then a lot of liberals on the other side, oh, it's too dangerous and intolerant because we should get the say over who gets saved if we're good enough. And this has always happened in the course of history. Totalitarian governments, democratic governments, traditional governments, modern governments, postmodern governments, everybody hates the cross when they understand what it actually says until you realize why. The cross stands against all schemes of self-salvation and pride. And that's why it's offensive. And I got to tell you, if you're offended today, great. You're halfway there. Okay? You're halfway there. You've bitten the bitter part. Now you got to see the fullness, the gospel of grace alone. See, if you stand in the middle in your life, you're neither going to be transformed or you're never going to walk in real life. You're going to sit there in this weird spot because people don't get it. But when you do see the cross and what it means, it changes everything. It changes why Paul says we boast in this confidence in our lives, that this is the center of the good news of grace of the gospel. It's the cross. Donald Guthrie in his commentary on Galatians says this, the natural world as such has ceased to have any claims on us. What does that mean? What it means is the things in our world that we give so much time and so much power and so much energy over us when we have and boast in the cross, a central promise of that, it means that those things no longer hold power over you any longer. 
because the cross becomes central. What you boast in is the center of who you are. I started this entire series talking about how Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians is what really kind of set the whole Wesleyan thing afire when they read this. Martin Luther, at the end of Galatians, he says this, when you fail, how do you protect yourself if not for the cross? How? Paul says, Galatians 6, 17, from now on that no one caused me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Paul was a guy who was beaten and rejected and ran out of town and people tried to kill him over and over. How does that not get you down? How do you not live in despair? Because it's not what he's boasting in. He's boasting in the cross. That's why in verse 12, he says, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. What do you defend yourself with? Is it your own works or is it the cross of Christ that you had nothing to do with except offering your sin? That's all you had. What do we boast in? Where's the center of our lives? Paul is saying we need to boast in the cross because only there will the created order have no power over us. When the cross has the final word in your life, we must ask ourselves, what am I boasting in? Besides the cross of Christ, what am I looking for to save me besides the cross of Christ? Because if you boast in the cross, you are free. The, Bi the God of the Bible is not like ancient fairy tale gods. You had to go and offer your children up to them. God himself puts his son up. God does say there is justice and the price must be paid, but the price is paid by God himself in Christ. There's a guy named Nicholas von Zinzerdorf. He was uh, the leader of this group called the Morovians. You probably don't care, don't even know who that is, but it's a missionary movement. And he became a Christian when he saw a picture of Jesus Christ being crucified. Not a picture, because they didn't have cameras, but a painting, okay? And underneath, underneath this picture, the artist wrote this, I have done this for thee, what will thou do for me? And it hit him. And he's like, oh, and he, and he saw his sin. He saw what Jesus did. And his answer was, he says, anything. I'll do anything. May I never boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, to which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So Paul ends Galatians 6.18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. How do we get that grace? Where are we? What have I been talking about the whole time? How do we get that grace? The cross. Exactly. Because the cross has the final word. That's the understanding. We... It all comes down to this. How did God deem to rescue and save his people? <laughs> is this on? <laughs> Guys, this is why we come to this, this place of understanding. Because when you understand the gospel, the good news, the cross, what Jesus did, that it's not about our goodness. God doesn't love us because we're lovely. God doesn't save us because he just, you know, He's like, oh man, those people are so great. I got to save them. He saves us because we cannot save ourselves. He saves us and loves us because it is in his character to do that, not in ours. We have run from God. We have rebelled against him. We have made ourselves our own God every single day. And yet God comes to rescue, redeem, and restore by the power of the cross. The cross leads to our sins being taken upon Christ himself. We get those expiated. But what you see in the cross and resurrection is that Jesus lays his righteousness upon us and we get propitiated. We get made favorable with God. When God looks at us, when we trust and believe in who he is, he sees us as he sees Christ. And it blows my mind because why, how, how could that possibly be? God has deemed it so. And so we trust him because of what he has done at the cross. And this is why we come to communion every week. It's a reminder because Jesus says, you do this in remembrance of me. Not just remembering Jesus, but what he did. The centrality of the cross that we have run, that we have rebelled. And Christ lays his righteousness upon us when we trust him. That's how we get restored relationship with God because of what our God did for us in Christ. And so today when you take communion, I want you to remember that. This right here reminds us of what Christ promised to do all the way back in Genesis chapter three. 
when, when Adam and Eve run from God and God promises himself to come and save us. And Jesus comes and makes that a reality because God is good for his promises to draw his children back. And if we boast in anything in our lives, meaning we find our confidence anywhere in our lives, we must find that at the cross. If you need prayer today, there's going to be people right across the way in the lounge. You can go during music. You can go after service. If you have questions about the cross or all these things I'm talking about, you can head right across there and talk to them. But if you have prayer requests and you want someone to pray with you about understanding the cross, maybe you think that you've been trying to do this all on your own, that there's some other way that we can be a people who get saved without the understanding of the cross, and you want to talk to somebody or pray with somebody about that, they would love to talk to you and pray about that, to come to the place where we surrender all that we are to all that He is and trust in His provision over us that He has bought for us at the cross so that we then get to live in new life given to us by Him. And if you feel the God in the midst of your life, that is Him calling you and drawing you to Himself because He is good. We are people who also give because God has given so much to us. At Element, we don't pass an offering plate. We have boxes by the walls you can give online, but we believe our giving is a response once we understand what God has done and God continues to do in our lives by being so generous with us. That's why we become a generous people. That's why God calls us to give, to look outside of ourselves and remember that He is the one who has saved us. And I encourage you to grab those sermon notes, take those questions maybe today, sometime this week, sit down with some people and talk maybe about the offense of the cross. Have you ever understood it enough to be offended? Maybe you thought that you were good enough. You had it all together. Your life was just perfect and great. And then you realized, oh my goodness, I am prideful and arrogant. You know who else is prideful and arrogant? The devil. You don't want to be like him. <laughs> we want to be a people who understand what we were saved from. We're saved from ourselves and our sin that burns for eternity before a holy God. And yet God came and paid for those sins himself on the cross in Christ. And so we want to understand the offense of the cross to us, but also what an offense our sins were before a holy God, and that God has deemed to rescue, to save, and to draw us to himself because he is good. And as you end the book of Galatians today, remember that the grace that Paul talks about is only because of the cross. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we thank you for a book like Galatians that spends so much time helping us to understand what grace is, the difference between grace and works. And that as we understand what grace truly is, we begin to live in that, to trust you for your provision given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. That in our lives, when we boast, when we find our confidence, we would find that confidence in you and what you've done because that can never be taken away. And if we are honest, we tend to boast in a whole lot of things that are not you. We keep thinking that something we say, something we do, some relationship, some job, some place, some something is going to give us the fulfillment and the life that only relationship with you can offer and restore. And so today, I ask that we would understand deeply the offense of what it means that you had to come and save us, but also the great joy that you did so. And that we get to live in that hope because the God who made everything knows us and has come to save us because we cannot save ourselves and that we would begin to boast and find confidence in you so when the world throws everything at us, we'd be able to stand in the face of it knowing that we have been saved, restored, and redeemed by you. And nothing would sway us from our confidence and boasting in the cross. And we ask this in your son's good name. Amen. So as we drop the curtains and we go through a couple songs right now, ask God in this moment to teach you what you are boasting in in your life. What are, what are you holding up? 
What do you take your confidence in? And then maybe ask him to show you the places where you, those confidence in those things have fallen apart. Where you always feel short or less than because you are boasting in these things. And then ask him to show you what it means to boast fully in the cross of Christ. To have that be your confidence and your hope. Because it can never be taken away. And then come and take communion, sing some songs. And again, we will head out in this world, hopefully, in a place where you understand where grace derives from. Where our hope comes to fruition because of what our great God has done for us. And that means we get to live in an unending joy that goes through happiness, it goes through pain, it goes through sorrow, it goes through excitement. It is consistent because we have a joy that is centered in the person of Jesus Christ.
cross-eyed look And to the cross I cling Of its suffering I do drink Of its work I do sing All in my Savior that God is love and God is just it's at the cross you beckon me draw me gently to my knees and I am lost for work so lost in love I am sweetly broken Holy surrender What a priceless gift Undeserved life Crucified. Oh, you call me a dead. You call me into life. And I was under your wrath. Now through the cross I'm reconciled. Gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so lost in love. But the cross has the final word There's nothing greater Nothing higher Nothing greater Than the name of Jesus All the honor All the power And all the glory
we thank you for the cross and that, Lord, that the, the power that, um, that you have, Lord, to, um, Lord, first the humility that you had to come here, Jesus, and to die on that cross. Lord, to make it offensive, to make it brutal, to suffer the way that you did, but the power that you had to rise again uh, three days later, Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have in that, for the grace and the love that you've shown us. And um, we love you and we thank you. And we pray all this in your name, amen. All right, Element, let's be a people that have our hearts centered around the cross. Let's, let's look at our lives, our cultures, our economies, our families, and our jobs centered around who Jesus is and go out from here and live that way. Amen? Amen. All right, we've got one more song. Will you guys all stand with us, please?
all go out and have a great week boasting in the cross. Jesus loves you.